Welcome to InvestorCom's Wealth Compliance Leader Series. In today's conversation, we have an absolute pleasure of speaking with Mr. John Carl, founder and president of the Retirement Learning Center. John is a 25-year veteran of the retirement industry and a true thought leader who has been featured in a number of news outlets, including CNBC, CNN, Forbes, and the Wall Street Journal. You'll hear about John's background, what got him interested in our industry to begin with, and his thoughts on all things retirement, specifically related to rollovers and the Department of Labor's PTE 2020 John, welcome. Very excited to speak with you and dig into the new rollover reality as you've coined it. Thank you, Parham. Pleasure and privilege to be here. Great. John, if someone were to pick up your bio, they'd certainly see that you're a prominent leader in the retirement industry. Uh, if we were to step back a little bit, uh, super curious to know what really got you interested in this side of the marketplace to begin with. Yeah, it's interesting, Parham, you asked that because, quite frankly, I was not <laughs> interested in this part of the industry, but uh, I was at an asset management firm that decided they needed to be more relevant in the retirement space. And they looked around the room, you know, at their, uh, you know, younger people and they said, well, we'll give this to Carl, he'll figure it out. And uh, I guess I did. I was fortunate to have a, a very solid ERISA attorney uh, that worked with me and for me. Um, that showed me kind of the way around things. So, uh, and that was, uh, geez, that was over 20 years ago. So uh, that, that's how I got assigned the task, I guess I would say. Now, if, if uh, given your 25 plus years of experience, John, if you had uh, a, a magic wand, you know, uh, in the regulatory space, in the financial, uh, you know, services space and retirement space, super curious, what would you do? What, what would you sort of uh, wave that magic wand uh, to do? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, and, and I will give credit to, you know, uh, Washington on a couple of things. You know, the, the, the big thing they're trying to address right now is the coverage gap. Right now, a great majority of Americans do not have access to retirement plans <clears throat> or any type of retirement savings vehicle. And the industry is addressing that. So that is would be one magic pixie dust to, to, to spread. And the other one, Parham, is, you know, uh, what you and I have talked about um, over time is this whole machination back and forth on the IRA rollover um, and all of the various uh, you know, iterations that we've seen come out of Washington. It's taken a long time to get where I think we finally are right now, that rollovers and plans uh, can coexist and have different and meaningful roles you know, in the industry. Rollover is not a bad word, I guess. Yeah, and, and so speaking of which, what are your thoughts? Why is there so much regulatory scrutiny between FINRA, the SEC's Reg BI, and now the Department of Labor's PTE 2020-02 on this, 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 this rollover uh, uh, effectively exercise that needs to take place? Well, I mean, I'll bottom line you, uh, Parham. I think the, the big uh, reason that you're seeing the regulatory scrutiny is somebody in Washington woke up a few years ago <clears throat> realized that IRA rollovers are larger than defined contribution assets. <clears throat> you know, that's where, you know, so, you know, Willie Sutton, you know, robbed banks because that's where the money is. So the regulators figured out, well, this, this uh, environment has more assets than our retirement plans on the defined contribution side. We better be paying attention to it. Um, and that is why you're seeing all the regulatory scrutiny, just simply because of the sheer size of it. Yeah, yeah, really good point. Okay, so a good chunk of the market segment is now going to be focused on uh, the, the, the sort of the new infamous term PTE 2020-02 uh, and the deadline being around the corner. First off, curious what your thoughts are on that piece of the regulation, uh, and then we can sort of dive in a little bit more as we get into it. Yeah, PTE 2020-02, which we got a little bit of a reprieve from here that was supposed to go into effect here at year end, is going into effect next year. <clears throat> And that means that you now have full enforcement uh, is what it means. And, and broker dealers have had a long time to prepare for this environment. And this, quite frankly, is a much more palatable environment than some of the previous proposed. But, you know, Parham, I think at the end of the day now, after all these machinations that we just you know, mentioned, um, we now actually have an effective, clear, no more delays, no more nothing. But it's going to be a net new environment. 
<clears throat> for broker dealers because they're going to have to document now. They're not going to have to have clients sign a best interest contract exemption, which was something that was on the table in a previous administration. But we now have very clear guidelines, rules for broker dealers and their advisors to engage in a compliant and scalable rollover business. But they're going to have to comply with this, uh, which means they're going to need you know, enforcement tools, compliance tools, review tools uh, to be able to do this in a scalable fashion. And the rules really aren't that draconian. I think they're pretty basic and straightforward and they make a lot of sense, but it's a net new reality. And this time it is actually a reality for them. Yeah, that makes sense. Speaking of reality, one of the key points of emphasis has been around, uh, you know, capturing costs as part of that analysis. Uh, first off, conceptually, um, do you have any views on that exercise uh, holistically? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an important exercise. I mean, from a, bu a bunch of different reasons, Parham. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I do a lot of work out in, in the field, you know, speaking with advisors and oftentimes their clients. And it never ceases to amaze me when we do client meetings that some of them don't even think there are fees related to their 401k or their 403b or other plans. So number one, you know, having the fee discussion helps Mrs. Lubner out there understand that, yeah, you know, there is costs associated with your plan. And then number two, of course, and this is that whole regulatory scrutiny of a larger environment on the rollover side is that, you know, there's going to be a difference between the costs that are there in your plan versus the costs that are in an IRA or a wealth management environment. And usually, not all the time, but usually those costs are going to be higher over on the IRA side. So making sure that the client or the prospect understands that there, number one, are fees in the plan. Number two, there are fees in the IRA and they could be higher. So therefore, you have to be confident <clears throat> and acknowledge that the services that are over on the IRA side of the equation justify uh, the higher fee environment. So I think the fee conversation in general is healthy. I think that, uh, you know, some of the misinformation that's out there could have been handled a little bit better. Speaking of uh, misinformation, uh, you've sort of set, setting me up nicely with the segues here, John. Um, you know, a lot of people have pointed to this 404A5, sort of these account statements. Uh, curious to know your thoughts on it and how attainable is that from a cost gathering perspective? Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> you know, this is, you know, this is, you know, I'll take a, a little bit of a knock on the DOL. So the DOL did a great thing with fee disclosure, right? There's 408B2, which is service provider fees. <clears throat> There's 404A5, which is participant level fees. So the concept is great, right? Let's disclose and let's you know, make sure that fees are out there. The, the flaw that I saw is, is in the infinite wisdom of the DOL, which this is what they often do. They didn't give you a format. So there's no standard format for 408B2 provider disclosure. So you can imagine that they're written in all different types of languages and forms, Vulcan being one of them probably. You know, and the same thing on the 404A5, there's no standardized disclosure and there's no requisite database. <clears throat> and I'll go into one step further, Parm, not to get too torturous here on this, but the hunt for the elusive 404A5, the DOL says that when an advisor engages with a participant or a prospect, client, whatever it is, they have to say, hey, you know, you need to understand you have fees in the plan, you know, show me your 404A5 so that I can compare that fee environment to the IRA environment I'm proposing. Um, but they're very quick to say that if and when the, the participant in the plan can't find that 404A5, then you can use public information, i.e. the 5,500 and some algorithm done by a great software company, et cetera, to give a third party estimate. And the reason they do that is that 404A5, number one, isn't in a standard format and there's two parts to it. I don't think anybody really understands that except maybe nerds like me um, and my JD, Jenny Kiffmeyer. There's two 404A5 parts. One is a firm level part, which tells you all the fees in the plan, you know, uh, that, that a participant could be in. That's not very helpful because, you know, I could be in the stable value. You could be in the target date fund. Somebody could be in the actively managed, you know, funds in there. Somebody can be in the passive. So our fees are all different, even though we're in the same plan. So a firm level 404A5 sounds great. And everybody's hunting for this mythical 404A5, but it's not particularly helpful to determine an individual's fees. Now, the second part of 404A5 is the quarterly 404A5 that is specific to the individual and what they've been invested in through the course of that quarter. That's very helpful. But again, it's very elusive. It's a quarterly thing. You know, where are, you know, we don't all have paper statements anymore. It's somewhere on your website. You know, it's, it's disclosed somewhere, but good luck finding it. Um, so that is the conundrum for them, if, uh, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So certainly there's going to be an additional layer of 
I guess, work that needs to be done by the advisors out there to capture that fee data. The other piece that's been net new from a, from a DOL PTE 2020 perspective has been this best interest uh, disclosure per se, uh, leaving outside the policies and procedures that need to be updated. Um, how do you, in your experience, John, how do you um, anticipate the market sort of embracing that outright disclosure uh, to, directly to the end investors? Yeah, I mean, the disclosure is net new, um, but, you know, they're in concert with the SEC here as well, too, which, you know, the SEC under Reg BI, notice they dropped the F word from their vernacular, which is only polite in any uh, terminology. The F word, of course, is fiduciary. Um, so we're now under the SEC for all type of advisory accounts. We're in a best interest standard versus a suitability standard. And here's the DOL coming out, you know, with the same thing as it relates to the all important retirement space. So, um, you know, the, the two big things that I see when you look at what's going on, you're going to have to have a mastery or a clear picture of what the person's client or prospect's plan environment is that they're in right now. You got to demonstrate that you knew what was going on environmentally in that so that you can compare and contrast what the IRA environment that you're proposing is. So that's the first thing. You got to know thy client. You got to know their plan environment that they're in and all the features uh, in that plan. Good, bad, and ugly. Then you got to compare that to the IRA environment. So that's your standard of care. And then you have to compare the fee environment that was in the plan, like we just talked about, to what you're proposing uh, in the IRA. So advisors are going to need help because in order to compare the plan environment to the IRA environment, it's bad use of an advisor's time reading plan documents. I'm sure they can go ahead and do that, but they're going to need a place to go to get that information. And that's the same thing on the fee side. I mean, you know, going and hunting for Mrs. Lubner's 404A5 you know, good luck. Um, and, you know, and maybe she can find it, but uh, having an organized system on their desktop that says, okay, you know, here's the approximation of the fees if you can't find that 404A5, because the fee comparison is the other major component of this. And then sending that out to the client and say, okay, this is what we discussed. Does this make sense? If so, yes, then you've got a compliant lower. Perfect. So, you, you know, there's a lot of uh, sort of due diligence, uh, if I could summarize it that way, that needs to take place by advisors. You mentioned sort of the desktop. Um, you know, what role do you believe technology holistically will play in that sort of end-to-end -end experience for reps and advisors? Oh, you know, I think it's got it's essential, you know, Parham. I'll, I'll make some fun of Retirement Learning Center. We've been in the business since 2003. We take advisor calls and we get about 1,100 calls a month. We've been giving out information on the phone, you know, for since, you know, 2003. I mean, <clears throat> and that's great. I mean, there's a, there's a place for that personal touch. But, you know, uh, I think, you know, in the modern environment, you know, to have that data, you know, imported for an advisor to have on their screen and say, okay, here's a snapshot of what Mrs. Lukner's plan environment looks like. If they need to talk to somebody about that, great. And then here's the fee comparison that you're hunting for. Look, if she can get you the 404A5, great, load that up into the system. Um, it'll be interesting to see whether your compliance department will let an advisor load a 404A5 up into their system, but then double check that across what's publicly available and an approximation. So, I mean, to me, everything that I'm hearing from the broker dealers out there, they're all searching for, you know, a tool, if you will, that uh, will make uh, the advisor... Uh, scalable in their ability to go after compliant uh, rollovers where appropriate. Hey, John, this has been fantastic, insightful, and bite-sized, exactly what we wanted our audience to hear. Thank you for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure, and you're truly a thought leader on this front. Thank you, Parham. If you enjoyed today's session, please like this video and subscribe to InvestorCom's YouTube channel for more insightful episodes like today.